Take it away, RJ and Jackson. Oh, boop. There we go. Unmute myself. Yeah, we're off and running on another week. Thank again, uh, scientist Mel, for uh, helping out in the hosting department. I know everybody is probably up in the air about all the coronavirus thing that's going along. I live in Washington State, where we've like got about a third of the cases so far. Although that's over on the west side of the state, there are no um, confirmed cases of coronavirus so far here in Spokane area. Um, yeah. Although they're being very precautionary, they're, they're uh, stopping sporting events and a lot of other things, which we were about to have a whole bunch of, of Gonzaga uh, basketball stuff in the arena and all that. Suddenly, uh-oh, uh, they're uh, going to be uh, uh, not selling all, all that. So anyway, and the emperor, of course, made his announcement of, of how he's responding ever so beautifully to all the events. So anyway, and my niece, who is a Montessori uh, school teacher, she's been very mindful of all these things, and she's in like that area she's not, um, within spitting distance of where the first cases were popping up there over in seattle so uh, i contacted her a bit ago and, and she's muddling along carefully and all of that fortunately the little kids have already been learning the procedures of how to wash your hands a lot and so they're really good at that anyway um for those of you who have been living in a cave all of this time um, this will be an incredible shock that i've been analyzing the contested bones creationist book by uh, rupee and sanford uh, John shocked. Sam shocked, John I say. Yeah, uh, John Samford is a major character in Creation is Stupid, whereas Christopher Rupi is a minor character in Creation is Stupid. Basically, he's done a little bit of stuff co-authoring with Samford, and he otherwise is just like a chemist who just suddenly popped up on the field. Uh, Samford, by contrast, who is the heavy gun of the two, didn't actually do much of it because all the research was actually being done by uh, San uh, Rupi, according to their description. And that's nothing to be terribly proud of, as uh, we've been showing week after week on here, going through the source material. Uh, I was invited to do this analysis of it from a, a full uh, source methods approach, and um, it can be grinding at times, but it's also very rewarding, because you find a lot of material that you probably didn't know. Uh, it's entirely possible, uh, in fact, we were just talking about this issue before we went on the air about how you can use creationist literature as a springboard to knowledge, not because of their conclusions, but because of the source issues that you arrive at. Um, some involve the direct sources uh, that whenever I find material that's full access, I put that up in the discussion, but also in the follow up research, like when you go, gosh, that's an old work. Is that true? Is there work done on it since? And um, then you can find out a little bit more about it. That's actually popping up in this uh, this very week uh, because they're going in on um, their end game to explain what their model is. And their end game involves um, trying to pigeonhole Neanderthals and, as it turns out, Homo erectus as just weird pathological human beings they are just kind of degenerate remnant little side populations, how this fits into Adam and Eve and whether they degenerated after the ark, you know, they're so far they're not saying, but nevertheless, um, uh, they've got some awkward problem going on in there. And so they were citing some material that they had cited previously, but some new stuff, uh, such as a uh, 2014 paper by uh, Sankaramaman uh, on the genomic landscape of Neanderthal ancestry. Uh, that I was aware of, uh, and their other work as well, but this was the first time they cited it in the book, uh, where they kind of overplay their hand on that one, because they're implying directly that uh, Neanderthals um, are um, uh, have a decreased fertility in males, uh, and that this is an indication of the defective nature of the, the mutant Neanderthal human beings. Um, it turns out that that paper didn't say quite that. It said that from what they could tell from the genomes that they were getting from the actual Neanderthals, that it was caught, the interbreeding was causing decreased fertility in males in the human context, not necessarily that Neanderthals had this. Now, eventually they did get, and by the way, I put up that paper, uh, as well as some of the other material from that same co-author team, uh, where they were going into the dating of all of this stuff, that um, the Neanderthal mixture with human beings was occurring somewhere likely between 47,000 and 65,000 years ago, which news alert is way older than the age of the universe, according to the young earth creationists. And then also another one of their papers that they did in 2016, 
on the Denisovan and the Neanderthal uh, landscape and infertility factor of that. And that Denisovan element is apparently showing up about 44,000 to 54,000 years ago, which uh, likewise is uh, way before the age of the universe, according to young creationism. Uh, now, they get into a little bit more interesting areas um, with their uh, later paper, uh, which is in relation to um, um, the genome landscape there that, uh, that I put the link up to, where they actually are arguing that uh, they are detecting from the genes that they've gotten in human beings that maybe that population group was about 40% less, uh, uh, air quotes, fit in the genes they were investigating. They weren't necessarily claiming that all Neanderthals back in the last 600,000 years were that way, uh, only that this particular group for the genes that they were looking at. So it was an interesting little data point, but as usual, the chronology would need to be scrunched down into an incredibly compressed time frame. All of that genetic information would have to be occurring when? In the from the original Adam and Eve time down or from the Noah time? There's a hidden hide the ball model that again they have yet to show. Maybe in the next pages as the chapter ends, because this is the last one in the book, they're gonna suddenly reveal, ta-da, what the hell they think is going on. And, and since uh, other than simply Sanford talking about genetic entropy and that it, it, in the earlier section where he recycled a lot of his previous uh, arguments uh, that I mentioned um, in the last- RJ, couple, you mentioned yeah. the coronavirus earlier. Yes. Of course, the, there's been cases going down in Florida Many of them are actually in the Tampa, St. Petersburg area. Guess oh, what? yeah, most of the states in the Union now have some examples. Oh, and, and um, uh, guess which airport is the closest to me? Oh, I, I, I'm suspecting it's the one that is the area where this has been going on. Tampa, St. Petersburg, yep. Yeah, and, and the difficulty <clears> was <throat> what what is worrying a lot of epidemiologists is the growth curve as people contact other people and particularly the very fact that coronavirus sorry for this little science blurb uh you probably get a lot of this material on the regular coverage and that so a lot of this you may be already aware of but just in case you're not that um the coronavirus is not sufficiently uh deadly where like you get it and you drop dead and pus is popping out of your eyeballs and all that instantaneously like SARS. No, that the vast majority of people will be asymptomatic, even if they have it for a while. And that means that people can be shaking hands and interacting with people like at the CPAC conference. Of what worries me, neither the president of the United States nor the vice president apparently have bothered to get checked to see if they've been exposed or not. It, and you go, hoax. We all know what? This. I heard um, uh, everyone's been making the jokes because uh, someone had coronavirus and was at a a convention with Ted Cruz and everyone's like, is the coronavirus okay? Yeah, that, yeah, it, yeah, indeed. Oh, that, oh, oh, coronavirus. Actually, it, the, but Donald CPAC, Trump said that the, the, the reaction to coronavirus was a hoax. Oh, and, and he was talking about his hunch and he was implying that he was really super knowledgeable that inevitable vague people who tell him that, oh, they're so amazed at how he understands all of this. And remember, his uncle was an MIT scientist, and therefore it rubs off. You know, science -y stuff is, is just something that you contact uh, just by uh, uh, being related oh, to people. Oh, my now. history As professor we all know, Donald Trump today, is an expert on everything. Right. My history professor today said that it was, a, it was manufactured as a weapon. Uh, wow, so, that and that's says a, a lot about theory. your history, Professor. <laughs> I know, he's, he's I teaching. I think you uh, may not want to pay too close. I think you may not want to well, assume that what he says as history is actually history. I would Oh, no, I mean, he's, for the most part, I mean, it, the, the normal stuff is fine. He's like, you know, just talk about the normal historical stuff. But then he kind of goes off on more recent history and Coronavirus modern was... stuff. And <clears> he just kind of goes kind of Alex Jonesy. Yeah, I would highly suggest fact checking time. anything he says regarding that past yeah, 150 yeah, that, that, years. This is somebody that's got an axe to grind, and therefore there's a Tortugan alert nee, 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 uh, flashing on there. Because you can find people that, that within a particular niche may sound ever so reasonable. It's possible even that James Cole, in certain contexts, will sound like he's actually reasonable <laughs> until he veers off into the other area. That's poor Jackson has uh, has just simply uh, bit the bullet and banned him. Uh, uh, basically muted. Well, him. I muted him. Uh, yeah, because I, I I don't have anyone blocked, but 
I I just I can't him and actually I just muted somebody else the other day the second person um uh, trigger man I think is his name he was he was doing like what mm. Cole did where he would leave he would post something on every single thing that I would post and it wasn't that he ever actually wanted to talk about it he would just kind of troll he would like Hit leave run, a, yeah. like a comment yeah, and so that I was like you're done whatever yeah, you don't yeah, ever want to engage it's, it's, uh, I so. with because my focus is on that methods angle I love the observation of it because the context of it and how they do or do not react and what's things they're linking to and not are all laden with implications about their method and of course I have a, a, a tremendously impervious stomach to all of this claptrap and so uh, I'm able to weather it in a way I hope that makes things more interesting. I was telling uh, the audience uh, or the group before we started up here that uh, based on a certain pending future project of ours uh, that uh, relating to uh, global warming and other things, I've been f paying close attention to some of the global warming people that I've been jousting with and tracking down. Quite a few of them are climate scientists that's, who that's are on idea. the pro pro climate science side. So they're actually filling me in on a lot of the background issues that they've been dealing with that I didn't yeah. already have in my reference base. So this is a, a, a useful future research pile. And of course, by jousting with, he means nuking from orbit. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, a scholarship is a contact sport. And if you okay. think that uh, that if uh, in the, if you're dealing yeah, with people who, who don't know the information, that's one thing. But if you know the information, it gives you a confidence and you can choose your words very tactically to, to try to push the opponent onto a field where they have to commit themselves on data field so where on, you can actually connect up with them and and on, most of the time you'll find uh, you, you probably have been watching uh, me over the time how difficult it is to nudge the tortucan mind onto the data floor oh very on scholarly works dan brown said it best here in the world of the internet scholars source methods isn't just a means of debate it is a sport and not only is it a sport it is a full contact sport yeah yeah oh so Lisa far, is asking uh, james Allard, how do they explain why humans and neanderthals have different genomes they don't they, they have to avoid that topic like the play. that, that uh, and and they're getting into the same problem you see the problem is uh, this is a terrible science alert here that like morphology Every is based on genetics thing. and and so therefore if you have uh, particular features as to uh, bone suture uh, uh, elements or uh, jaw growth rates and tooth um, what just happened um. well, Neanderthals have really indicated um, how the um, uh, 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 the genomes of Neanderthals are distinctively different and the morphology of them is beyond the range of what we find in human beings. The fact that we were still able to do uh, um, interbreeding once in a while, wow, wow. Yeah, da, 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 da. Uh, a little bit of, of uh, interbreeding uh, now and then, and it was probably only a hundred or so interbreeding episodes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, although who knows what was going on. In fact, uh, there's no indi uh, it, there's no way to determine uh, how many breeding interactions uh, didn't work out, and we only the, re the only reason we don't have any genetic credentials, and so he theoretically should have been contributing more to the understanding of this issue. Uh, Rupi has no experience in this; he's a chemist, and so it's all basically whiffling off of the authority quotes uh, that they deal with. They're still running about the same ratio of uh, about forty percent of the material is being presented only for authority quotes and uh, a big chunk of it is uh, secondary material and of the technical citations they deliver uh, about 50 percent of them are being misrepresented because they're suppressing the information in it that conflicts with their argument that's not good that should be like zero rate it should be at at, at flu death rate level of like you know even one percent of misrepresented sources is a serious problem 50 percent is just terrible uh, and so you got a problem there. And overall, they're running at about 500 sources all told in the book. Uh, and maybe there'll be a few more added on by the end of it, but that's kind of where we're sitting at. And from our vantage of like 4,000 sources plus for um, uh, 
Uh, the rocks were there. 500 ain't exactly impressive. <laughs> Yeah, and no, I suspect really. the amount no. of misrepresented sources is around zero percent. In proper scientific work, uh, that's how it's supposed to be. That that uh, it, it's when you're looking at like controversial areas where people, where you do in fact have fistfights going on between two camps, where they are literally arguing over what happened. Uh, in fact, we're going to have a section on that. Uh, spoiler alert in the new volume two, and we get that out of the way because there's an interesting discussion in the geological community about the uh, Black Sea flooding hypothesis that um, has been presented by a, a group of geologists and I have a tendency to favor it, uh, it. But there are some cadre of geologists that are just digging in their heels and saying, no, uh, there is no indication of rapid erosion in the uh, uh, Bosporus. And uh, um, so there, there's a, a, a genuine dis a dispute going on area. Uh, that's not what we're getting in the discussion of human origins and the genetic information. And basically, or the flood. Or, well, or the flood, yeah, yeah. And, and um, uh, uh, um, uh, alas, Rupi and Sanford have not weighed in on the flood. Oh, I would have been a happy camper if they had shot their mouth off on that issue. And they might by the end of the book, I don't know. But, oh, and um, uh, by the way, I actually did run the numbers for the ice media using Aaron Ra's 1300 kilometer wide ice wall and a cometry speed of 30 kilometers a second and the result was upwards of in the exaton range meaning it's no longer a planet fryer it is a planet cracker oh oh scientist mel i agree with you completely we have to address the fact that the president of the united states has been hoarding all of the orange spray and my oompa loompas are not pleased <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, the we, uh, the unnatural coloring that occurs in there. But remember, uh, Donald Trump is apparently impervious to all um, viruses and reason. And so uh, maybe he'll get through all of this okay. We'll find out. There could be terrible ironies afoot. But anyway, um, uh, the, the coronavirus is a depressing uh, element to deal with. Anyway, um, they're now all in the uh, anti-evolution book. They're also uh, going on about uh, Homo erectus as supposedly pathological organisms that are like kind of normally human, but they have shrunken little brains and therefore they're a pathetic, wretched uh, mess that, uh, and the problem is Homo erectus is the group that spread all over the planet. <laughs> it's not as though they're some tiny little niche population that's popping up in, in South Africa. Homo they're, erectus is a bunch of badasses. They are indeed, everywhere. yes. They were the they were the uh, the primate that really went out, and and they were the first of the Homo species that just exploded all through everywhere that they could walk to, and did it. As Elton John said, "On that trail that we blaze." Were you about ready to jump in there, Jackson, and say something, or? Um. <laughs> Not really. I mean, uh, <laughs> go home erectus. Go home erectus. Yeah, yeah. That. Um, um, that. Well, for one uh, thing, I'm amazed. Uh, I'll give you one thing. Clear that he um, did. RJ. Oh, you're breaking it, up a little. Uh, am I roboting? Or yeah, just you were like roboting slightly there. Yeah, I don't know. Um, um, did TD Lane tell you at some point he wanted to bring up Alan Fiducia? Oh, oh yeah, oh, I, yeah, uh, oh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, Fiducia is an absolutely fascinating character. He pops up, of course, in Slam Dunk, and even more in uh, um, Rocks Were There, because he is um, the Fred Hoyle of bird evolution. He is the contrarian who is an evolutionist, but he is the main authority figure for every anti-evolutionist, whether they're young Earth creationist or old Earth creationist or intelligent designer who wants to poke holes in the bird dinosaur model, Fiducia uh, is usually the one they're going to. And the problem is that he has not been faring very well in terms of like data explanation. Uh -oh. and, he, and he's becoming farther and farther uh, removed onto the sideline. The major, pro for those of you who don't know your uh, bird origins controversies, uh, back in the day, I alluded to it a bit in the old uh, tip material up at my website. So feel free to download and all that because that'll give you some of the historical context on it. 
Uh, Troubles that, in Paradise. Uh, Fadu well, this is, yeah, yeah, Troubles in Paradise text. It's got pictures, too. Uh, and so you can just download that little cutie. It's a nice book length book. That was the one that, amazingly enough, uh, David Berlinski even tried to get published, and that didn't quite work out, although that's a long side story uh, that we'll have to talk about at some point. But anyway, Fiducia um, uh, has always been advocating that there is some undetermined group of thecodont from the Triassic that birds develop from, and they've never been able to find the slightest paleontological support for this thing. Let me guess, because it doesn't exist. That would be one hypothesis, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and the and the meanwhile, uh, more and more, particularly after John Ostrom, who we quote a big section of him uh, later on in the book, the bird sections kind of yes, sprinkled all through uh, the rocks were there, uh, but the. Um, uh, uh, the Deinonychids, uh, if you remember the Velociraptor from Jurassic Park, that is Deinonychus. If they call it Velociraptor for an odd reason, but Dionychus. it's actually, yeah, di uh, uh, Deinonychus, and uh, um, it's um, a big man sized critter. That one really jump started the issue because it had so many bird like features and also showed a mutant Cerisian style pelvis that had been warping around in the direction that looks suspiciously bird like. Uh, and so that was coming in when, in back in 1969, all you had basically was Archaeopteryx as the benchmark and then some early Enantronithian birds uh, from the Cretaceous. You had just practically nothing. Uh, going on. Well, it ain't virtually nothing now <laughs> because we have just had a, a tidal wave of paleontology since the 1990s where we now have an enormous number of bird samples include and feathered theropods and feather evolution. Including one they found just this past week. Yeah, yeah. We have a, a catalog, uh, another thing that will make it really handy for organization, um, a nice listing on a couple of pages of the 35 genera of feathered theropods that are presently known. That's genera. <laughs> it's not, you know, just, just like there's one or two species and they found a few. No, that's the, the 35 genera. That's, there, there's only something like, uh, um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of how many uh, genera there are, like 500 genera of dinosaurs altogether. So it's, it's, a, it's a big chunk. Uh, and that's not even including the feathered dinosaurs other than theropods of which there are also evidence of them. And the almost feathers that we're seeing in other branches of dinosaurs, these integuments on the back of Cetacosaurus and all of that stuff. Not, so not it, to mention pycnofibers on uh, pterosaurs, yeah. which is evidence that pycnofibers might be basal to both. Yeah, and of course the, uh, uh, the, the Alabardi's work and others in the developmental biology uh, department has been enormous. And of course I had alluded to that in Slam Dunk and how creationists just like to not pay um, any attention to that. Actually reading about the evolution of feathers in Prum's book right now. Yeah. Yeah, the Which, uh, Prum has been, yeah. has been knee deep in the paleontology of it. He had uh, partnered up with um, Alan Brush uh, yep. back in the uh, early 21st century where both of them are, were approaching it from the developmental biology end of how do feathers develop. And in order for them to have evolved, they needed to have evolved in a way that was consistent with how the developmental biology of feathers are constructed. And so anything had to be a, a viable option there. So they worked out um, uh, a series of protofiber stages uh, proto feather stages that made developmental biology sense. Now, at the time they came up with this, there were no actual paleontological confirmation of this at the time. Since then, oh gosh, that's changed. And in fact, they have literally found one of the predicted transitional form proto feathers in amber. <laughs> So we yeah. don't have to guess that these things existed. We don't know whether it was off of an early bird or off of a feathered theropod. It didn't have a little tag next to it to say. But the point is, is that by the Cretaceous, there there was still an enormous number. We know from the, the odd number of, of extraordinary non-avian uh, theropods floating around there that have got feathers on them. Uh, you know what, that, can I bring up something oh, uh, yeah, nifty in recent news? Um, very recently, a the head of a um, Hummingbird sized uh, bird. Was found. Oh, that little itty bitty dinosaur. Hundred million year old in amber. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's what changed. I was referencing earlier. Fascinating. Up until that time, I think the smallest actual dinosaur was like chicken sized. And so uh, it was always an interest is was there some dynamic constraint to dinosaurs that kept them fairly big? Well, this now shows nope, actually, they could get itty bitty bitty bitty. 
And so that's yet more blips on the scope. So everybody, everybody who loves dinosaurs uh, should be just delighted that they're living in this contemporary world because we are happy campers when it comes to the amount of science information that's available on here. It's just astonishing how much has been since the mid 1990s. And so anybody who is 25 years old or less is living in the we have tons of information zone and older farts like me are from the wow have things changed zone. The problem is is the creationists still get stuck on the material from the past. So they're still dredging up material like Alan Fiducia uh, of, and articles that he was writing. They, they, some of them pay a little attention to his more recent stuff and he keeps on he keeps publishing papers. I mean he hasn't stopped but it's getting harder and harder. Even he's kind of been moving away from some of the doctrinal positions uh, that he takes previously because it's getting harder and harder to draw that line between the feathered theropods and, and the birds. Um, the, the most notorious case, for years he had been insisting that solarosaurs were dinosaurs that only bore a coincidental very, uh, similarity to birds, your dinonychids. In that. other words, he was saying, nuh uh. Then they started finding indisputable cases of solarosaurs with feathers, at which point he suddenly decides that solarosaurs are actually flightless birds that just have a coincidental similarity to dinosaurs. Same critters. <laughs> right. The fun which, thing is that um, the, arc, the line which you mean, gets even funnier when you realize that tyrannosaurs also have feathers and also ornithischians have feathers too. Yeah. So yeah, at least the, at least the smaller ones are. Uh, uh, that uh, the, 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 the by the time you get to full blown T. Rex, the really big ones, um, then it's they don't really have necessarily a need for it. Although we don't have every square inch of a tyrannosaur uh, integument to tell whether or not they had feathers uh, like on their arms or something or a tail feathers Al or not. Although uh, there is actually, uh, there was actually some question of whether they might have the uh, sort of uh, scale like feathers on their legs, which vultures have. Yeah. There was some impression. And so there was a question about that. Yeah. So the paleo, so don't, don't count out. Uh, we know that there were quite a few of the tyrannosaurids that do indisputably have feathers because we got the fossils that showed them this is not speculative now they're, they're, they're cousins and they're smaller ones and all that elisa asked uh, kent hovind hasn't updated since he went to prison oh yeah that's true um he's he's learned how to copy more stupid creationists though so um i i say as a guesstimate probably 90 to 95 percent of what pops up in a modern Kent Hovind lecture is the same claptrap that he has in his spreadsheet database going back decades. But we know from the Harun Yaya case where on birds in relation to fiducia, this is right up the alley. If you haven't seen the evolution hour I did on that, I also alluded to it when I debated Hovind. Um, that, that's an example of him cribbing uh, Harun Yahya stuff from about 2003 that's riffing off of 2002-ish Alan Fiducia. And here's Kent Hovind, 2018, copying that material and, of course, never fact-checking any of it. I mean, he doesn't do that. No, that would be so exhausting if he wanted to do that sort of thing. But yeah, Fiducia is um, a, an intriguing character because he is still um, a, a, a okay scientist within his domain. He's an ornithologist and he's very knowledgeable on a lot of subjects and still does things provided that he doesn't get taken as gospel uh, when it comes to the phylogeny. The one area that he cannot stand and has never used is cladistics. He is a not, he's a morphological based uh, analyst and that puts him in dinosaur category if I can use the word as a pejorative. Yeah, that, that's outdated. I know. We and, need to. Oh, yeah. We need to come up with a new term to replace. You know, saying someone's a dinosaur. How about if we call them a Trump? Oh, that, that's a good one. I think another one would be. Hmm. Something that's very old, very archaic. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, we'll have to work on that one. But Trump certainly applies. Ah, it's... Mitch McConnell. Yes. Yeah. Well, that that's more of the of the uh, Tenurin class of. <laughs> Of, of, of uh, extinct organism on there, and he he he, get, he gets back and, and chaws on his lettuce leaves every once in a while there in the Senate. But anyway, <laughs> it, it before I mean, uh, Mitch McConnell's actually I mean, Luca. 
Yes, he, yes. He tucks there. his little head into his turtle shell. Right, right there, yeah. We, we shouldn't really do it because that is really a terrible insult to all the perfectly self-respecting tortoises and, and uh, <laughs> like that we don't want to insult Dee Dee Lane, them, like, you now owe all tortoises in the history of the world a sincere and... Absolutely. Apology. We do not apology. wish to disparage or, or even, we don't even want to let them know about Darwin because, uh, to paraphrase Green Victoria, we don't want it, we won't want to insult them and scare them by making it widely known that tortoises are even distantly related to Mitch McConnell. I, and, uh, I, I formally apologize to all turtles and stem turtles. <laughs> In fact, yeah. I apologize to all diapsids, period. Yeah, indeed. Um, uh, it, it's an intriguing thing because uh, on, on the whole notion of dinosaur as an insult, uh, that up until the revolution in thinking about dinosaurs, which was really starting to kick in high gear in the 1970s and 1980s on, to reevaluate the metabolism of dinosaurs and warm-bloodedness and active and, 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 but when I was growing up, dinosaur term would be a sluggish, doomed to extinction, also ran failure compared to all of us cute little mammals. And even in, in the, the H.G. Wells movie, uh, Things to Come, when he wanted to imply something about bad naval technology, he described it uh, uh, along the side in the, in the radio announcement referring to the sinking of the battleship dinosaur. <laughs> and that summed it up in one term. <laughs> but, but now, yeah, you can't use dinosaur as an indication of, of, of doom or incompetence. I suppose we could use Edsel uh, the car that might be another example of it you know rover uh, uh, yeah that, or, that's one in british or, rover cars yeah yeah or or the yugo uh the yugoslavian knockoff of the fiat lada the, the lada oh yeah the soviet vehicles and all of that there we go i think so a we'll have to have named like, Tangenberg, a ship the most named titan a car named <laughs> Uh, yeah, so anyway, uh, there we go. Uh, oh, a little bit past the half hour. Uh, let me uh, stop to give a thanks to all of the wonderful uh, uh, patrons uh, who have helped keep the project going and have made the finances each month way easier than it was beforehand. Buy uh, his got, damn book. Yeah, uh, we have our colleagues, Hendrel and Eric and Speed of Sound and Suris and Zeshi. Uh, we have our researchers, Travis and Convert and Eat and James and the History Minor and Ralph and Palodia. Well, I always mispronounce your name. And Apologia. Uh, I know, that's why, but I, I'm locked into calling it Apologia. It's a, how I see that name, and I, I apologize absolutely and abjectly for that. Fools, he's obviously called. Apologia. So you and, Apologia. And uh, assistant researchers Mike and Ian and Duranku and Benjamin and Todos Real and our friends Daniel and Steve Bauman and Mary Gail Beddows and Insects Pool and Devin Reeves and Morton and Paul Skeptic and Puffalopagus and Bo Rasmussen and Staggles and Alex Stone and Paul Williams and then our legacy patrons who were able to help at various stages uh, Jan and Jody and John and Keith and Andrew and Dyer and Yui and Mona and Brad and Daniel and Yanya and Sun and Ugly German Truths and Everett and Sewer. Every one of you, it has been, uh, uh, I'm very grateful for all of your uh, support there because you're uh, sticking real live money at the talking head face from Spokane and that uh, I appreciate that it shows that you have confidence in me and you feel that you're doing something that's worthwhile because I'm doing something worthwhile so thank you very much on that and yes buy the book I have well, of course, link. I've got a question yeah regarding the whole issue of your book how many mm -hmm. sources does it have again? Uh, I, I actually don't have an exact count, but I know from the volume of it, in, in when it was six point type that before I shrank it down to get us in under the wire for publication size, uh, it was uh, over 200 pages long. And that's twice the length of the one in uh, Evolution Slam Dunk. Holy we had 20, shit! We had 2,300 sources in Evolution Slam Dunk, so I would rec I would expect that we must have somewhere in the neighborhood of 4,000 plus sources in it. So you have so many sources that your book is composed at least one fifth of sources. Uh, uh, yeah, 600 pages of text and about 160 pages of uh, references. In we are print. sources. And then, yes, yeah, and, and then a full indexing, which is more than can be said for the stupid 
books that we go. Um, you the, the more you like can corner, use it honestly. as a doorstop and a weapon. Yeah, it, it, you can hold it. You can <coughs> hold down napkins at uh, a breezy 4th of July picnics. There's various functionalities for Evolution Slam Dunk, but fortunately, I think the content of it is the most interesting. Uh, and uh, um, it, it, it certainly is hitting the ground in topic after topic. I've been delighted at the issues where on Twitter, uh, somebody is bringing up a particular subject matter or some particular uh, hot button item and I'm able to go, oh, Jackson, we have, a, uh, and I have a section on that in Evolution Slam Dunk, or in the, in the, the rocks for there. And uh, because we've been very attentive to make the work really useful for what modern current creationists are doing in the twaddle department. So that we're not going after stuff that Dwayne Gish was saying like 40 years ago. In fact, Dwayne Gish only comes up kind of peripherally uh, in the book. Yeah. He's kind of like a little side issue. No, we're paying attention to, of course, the answers He's in Genesis. He's like the grandpa you try to avoid at the family reunion. Yeah. Well, we've reached the stage now where, where Gish is so far back in time and he died in the early 2000s. And so virtually all of his main apologetics is from the 20th century, that most of the current branch of leading edge creationists aren't relying on him. They don't need to rely on it. They've got a whole new set of stuff oh, no. that they're yeah, copying. No, uh... Yeah, the most notable thing that he did that I seems can to be brought up by like anti -evolutionists None of them have even read RMT. him. That's about it. Oh, 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 oh was that TD? Uh, regarding what Gish has done, it seems the most notable thing that's still being cited by him is RMT stuff. Mm. And well, the, the flame-throwing Parasaurolophus, uh, that, you know, f uh, flame-throwing dinosaur dragons, that's something that Dwayne Gish helped contribute to in his uh, kids' books and stuff. Uh, I cover all of that in Dinomania at the well, TIP website. You can download I, that. I guarantee none of the creationists who are online now have read Gish. Like very few, very few. Of them. Yeah, that um, uh, for one thing, most of it isn't available online, and most mm -hmm. of the uh, anti-evolutionists you bump into in general are uh, web crawlers. So they're going to be hunting around. They're going to be—you can just hear their little fingers going tippy tap, tippy tap uh, when they're doing their little Google oh searches. Oh gosh! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> standing uh, for I truth. Think TD, uh, TD saw. I, I believe you did the other day. The creationist who was just quote mining. He quote mine like three different sources. Did you see that? Oh, yeah. well, that, that's their main addiction. Um, the the he, odds are, the, the unusual ones are ones who aren't quote mining. Well, well, no, RJ. Here's well, the the first one. He quoted some guy from a book, and I know because I found like a, a the clip. He quoted a guy who was talking about Darwin's view of the fossil record, but he quoted it as though it was the paleo the paleontologist as his modern view of the fossil record. And then he quoted the Amazon page for Lynn Margulis' book on speciation, uh, which is, as you know, is really weird because it's all about symbiosis with bacteria. Yeah, and is, let's say, has not set the biological house on fire. <laughs> no, it was, and then he quoted one, uh, oh, he quoted Gould, of course. And I so love I have, it. We'll um, see, oh, I Dapper have... Dino! Dapper Dino was doing it. With, he was having a discussion on. Isn't uh, Stephen Jay Gould a scientist? Yes, yeah, Stephen yes, Jay is. Gould is a paleontologist, um, uh, very influential uh, on my thinking. Um, he was, uh, along with Niles Eldridge, coined the term uh, punctuated equilibrium. I've got uh, I've a and lot of the skivvy on that. And creationists in tip just love quote mining him. Oh, uh, yeah, because, and, because and at their peril. Talks... Be well, because, because he, he talks would hit about, back. Um, um, gradualism. Whenever he talks about evolution, he would contrast gradualism, which was the paradigm for a long time, that's what Darwin proposed, yeah. and what he and Eldridge were proposing, which was punctuated equilibrium. And so when he would say um, there, you know, paleontology does not support gradualist evolution, the creationists would see that and go, aha! Paleontologists are saying evolution isn't supported by the fossil record, but that's that's not the sense he was using the term, and if they read his work, they don't, then they would know that. Yeah, uh, I did a whole posting. One of the things that was one of my early analysis of uh, source methods was uh, who misrepresents punctuated equilibrium in Stephen Jay Gould and the various quotes that he comes up with. 
so i have been keeping track of that no a while and tip one point two at my website is a compendium of the various any evolution usages of punctuated equilibrium and so because i i've studied all of them i can state rather smugly that anti-evolutionists do not understand punctuated equilibrium and discuss it seriously even when they bring it up themselves <laughs> no Mostly actually because they don't uh, understand it <laughs> yeah yeah it's, um, it, in the next book uh Menton brings it up again so just heads up uh-oh we're gonna have more discussion to that um and and it, uh, ultimately uh as i point out in tip 1.2 uh, what Gould was ultimately discussing was how to apply sympatric uh, spe uh, allopatric speciation to the fossil record. This was the idea that speciation by geographic isolation for vertebrates, which was their major area of interest, um, was the dominant form. And that, in fact, we know that if you've got um, uh, allopatric speciation and genetics going on, you're going to have punctuated bursts in the fossil record and in genetics. It, you can't avoid it. It's inevitable Darwinian naturalism uh, that you can't get rid of it. Um, sympatric speciation, which is an A turning into a B so that A doesn't exist anymore because all you have left is B. That was the mo mode and it's going slow as molasses increments, constant speedism. Those were some of the things that uh, the geneticists tended to kind of think about back in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, which is the gestational period for the time that Stephen Jay Gould is coming out of, and he's coming at it from the paleontology end, where uh, another one that you may or may not have heard of, George Gaylord Simpson, who was kind of the mentor to Stephen Jay Gould, he was a paleontologist, uh, died, I think, in the early 1960s. And, Something like um, that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he was very he, concerned with the rates of evolution. Yeah, he was the one that was noticing this same phenomenon. That what you tend to see is a, a range of things that stays pretty much the same. And then the next time you see something kind of like it, it's kind of jumped to a new level and it's now doing something a little bit different. But it's not as though you've got this slow, smooth transition in between each other in the specific way that was being expected by the phyletic gradualism crowd. And there was a bit of a tussle for a while between uh, Gould and Richard Dawkins, and Dawkins reflected a lot of that John Maynard Smith uh, slow modality bit. And, and even to this day, um, uh, uh, Dawkins is kind of slow to use the terminology that Gould has. He's finally well, you know what's funny started, about that? Yeah, he was. You know what's kind so of, funny about that, R.J.? Yeah, is uh, Dawkins wrote an article for Nature where he talks about, he wrote this article he wrote is titled, uh, What Was All the Fuss About? Where he basically said, or Gould wrote this, Gould and Eldridge wrote this paper back, I think it was the 90s or 80s, where they're talking about how punctuated equilibrium was resisted, and it was by Dawkins and Philip Gingrich and a few others. And so you have the resistance, then you have, then after it becomes accepted, they bet the, the detractors basically What's said, well, we knew about? it all along. They said, yeah. well, yeah, we kind of knew it all along. Darwin said this from the very beginning. So what's so funny about the, the about the paper is they wrote this before, I, th I believe, no, it was after. That's right. So they were talking about, you know, everyone fought against us, and now everyone's saying, well, yeah, there's no problem here. We always thought this. And they're like, what? What is going on? Yeah. I track it in terms of terminology. I can inform you that the punctuated concept pops up regularly in the science literature, that they, it's yes. used not only relating to paleontology, but to, to genetics and all sorts of things where they'll just say, it's just part of the toolkit now. No, nope, there, right. there's very little of it. But, the, but Dawkins still is reluctant, not impossible to use the punctuated equilibrium term, well, but sure. it's not something he likes to use I mean, because it's from yeah. the arch enemy, Stephen Jay Gould and from the other camp. <laughs> well, I think what's so funny about it is in The Ancestor's Tale, which is one of my favorite books of all time, he does mention punctuated equilibrium in the epilogue. So it's a 700-page book, and it gets a mention in the epilogue. And just a, a, a it, meanwhile, yeah. Oh, um, uh, I've, we've actually spared the audience the horrifying experience of talking about James Cole, uh, which was the second half of the thing. So I'll simply summarize it so we can keep talking about interesting things like Stephen Jay Gould. Um, oh, dear, you Cole, haven't spared them for long. 
Yeah. Um, uh, Cole was bringing up um, a, a paper from George Ellis, who is a physicist, and he implies, uh, Cole, as usual, implies everything supports his vague creationism. So And so he's talking about supposedly that this is blowing up biology from a physics direction. Uh, the paper that I put the link to, which is what Cole linked to, doesn't really do that. And Surprise. then uh, a video that he uh, dealt with as well um, basically, uh, uh, Cole brought it up because along the way in the Q&A section, Ellis happens to kind of slightly give a little backflip to Richard Dawkins style materialism because Ellis is religious. But that's it. And, and the, the irony, of course, is Cole doesn't like the Big Bang. But Ellis does because he's a cosmologist. Right. So the weirdness of his selectivity of picking out a source, this is like not only um, a bringing up somebody who has a loaded gun and is about to blow your foot off, but actually pointing the, the barrel down to the foot before firing it. This is just really bad on his part. So it, you, you can follow up on all that claptrap. But the Dawkins um, uh, Gould stuff is really quite intriguing because um, I never paid a hell of a lot of attention to Richard Dawkins for years because Sunday. he didn't do he didn't do things on dinosaurs and that was my main area of interest and so yeah, I was paying much more attention to to Gould. Now uh, Jackson's the other way around where Jackson you paid much more attention to Richard Dawkins and only recently have kind of come into some of the Gould stuff. So um, it's yeah, which um, framework for me. Well, the reason. It was probably, as Gould would say, just contingency. Um, <laughs> because the very first Dawkins, uh, The Blind Watchmaker, was the first nonfiction book I read for fun. I kind of got to a point where I was like, I kind of want to read nonfiction now. And so that just happened to have been the first one mm -hmm. that I picked up. And so I read that. And then from then on, I was like, ah, like his, he's very poetic. And Dawkins is very uh, savvy in literature. And so is Gould, obviously. But. Um, yeah. I like his style, and I was reading a lot of that, and so... Dawkins um, uses less semicolons. Dawkins does use less semicolons. Uh, and so I and so I kind of, you know, I, I was reading a lot of that, and I really didn't... I never got myself a Stephen Jay Gould book, but I got one from a researcher, uh, which was uh, Wonderful Life, and so I've now read that, and I really like his style also, and so I, I might read some more of his stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, his last major, he, of course, he did a whole book on punctuated equilibrium. Uh, I think like 2001, two, I, I think it was his last book out. But the giant opus magnum for Gould is uh, Structure of Evolutionary Theory, I think it's called. Yeah. And it's like a and thousand pages. A, <laughs> it, it makes our little teeny tome <laughs> seem like a paperback. I mean, you know, no, this thing is huge. It's thousands of yeah. pages long. And, and um, it, but it is um, enormously thought provoking, a bit repetitive because there's a certain amount of tell you what it's gonna tell you and then go into the telling you and then a reprise of what it told you. So there's a tripartite structure that actually kind of pads it out from my point of view. But nevertheless, it's always a, a delight to read Gould because he's always going to be questioning the assumptions and checking and poking at what you thought was so and let's see what the data are. Although Gould was not infallible, um, that, uh, that, that there were uh, errors and stuff that he could deal with on things. But nevertheless, he was always well, an extremely thought-provoking guy. I mean, to be fair, in his defense, some of it <laughs> was not his fault. Uh, Wonderful Life, for instance, the idea that the Cambrian radiation was far more explosive than it was was not his fault so much as that's what the thinking was at the time yeah and so he was well, there were some areas that, that that uh the one area that's intriguing and again there's a background context which kind of is more topical today than it was 10 15 years ago and uh, is that there's a political element because a uh, uh, ghoul is very left-wing and uh, Dawkins would not be that. There was a more conservative element in John Maynard Smith's branch and all of that. And uh, 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 Niles Eldridge is also quite left wing. And then uh, one of uh, uh, Gould's mentors, who's still knocking around, my God, is that guy immortal? Uh, uh, Richard Lewontin, the geneticist, is, a, is an outright Marxist. Uh, and so <laughs> yeah. that, yeah, I mean, it's like talking about your dinosaur viewpoints, you know, it, he's, right. he's a very unusual one on that, but, and, and a brilliant mind. So you still have that knocking around. And there was always the 
squabbles that went on between was taking place in the 1970s in the need to the idea of uh, nature versus nurture, how much of things are uh, uh, amenable to selection pressures and other things, how much uh, a, a thing that I think Gould won a lot of the argument on is his insistence, not everything's adapt, an adaptation, not everything is adaptive, not everything is selection, that you can have things that oh, can be floating. Actually, yeah. Uh, oh, I'm uh, sorry. In the, in the uh, era. Continue with that thought uh, out. Oh, Lisa for Truth asked, how did the pyramids survive the flood? Oh, that's an interesting little question because the they creationists didn't. have a teeny problem. They can't have the Egyptians exist at the time of the flood. It's a big problem because their contiguous history is so complete that they have to basically pull all of Egypt down past the flood because you can't have pre-flood Egyptians because of the nature of what it means to have the flood. If you have Egyptians with hieroglyphs and particular customs and architectural styles, and then the flood comes along and kills them off, and Noah's kids then breed like rabbits and repopulate Egypt and conveniently take up exactly the same religion and exactly the same architectural styles and exactly the same stuff as the pre-flood ones that they really weren't aware of, yeah, that's a problem. So um, I've been just waiting for the shoe to drop and for the flood geology people who by and large are not Egyptologists to have to go, uh, we have to pull the flood down past that because if the pyramids are being built during the flood, it's odd they didn't notice. So uh, the, the new breed yeah. of people, um, I, uh, Duan, I think his name is, or something, uh, uh, starts with a D. Uh, there are a very small number, two or three at most, who are kind of trying to reconfigure Egyptian chronology. You can practically see them with their little jacks going <laughs> and they put the little rollers underneath the Egyptian chronology and then they go like Cecil B. DeMille, heave ho, heave ho, to try to move all of the, everything from pre-dynastic times, hopefully, all the way down past that bottleneck of 2350 BC. Needless to say, it ain't gonna work, but nevertheless, and, it'll be amusing And remember, to see. the pre-dynastic period of Egypt goes the, back to the, like 5,000-ish BC yeah. before the world existed for them darn it's almost though their chronology is fictional isn't it it uh, yeah yeah this just as a, as a as a while off the off the head hypothesis here their 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 their, their chronology is a pile of dingoes kidneys that's all <laughs> <laughs> but anyway yeah so there's the bit about and of course you've got more than just the egyptians uh, you've got uh, the Chinese culture, and it's no coincidence that mm -hmm. other than a little bit of apologetics, and we'll be alluding to some of this in volume two, uh, apart from some of the apologetics where they try to argue that there are like Egyptian or uh, 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 Chinese uh, uh, glyphs that uh, are actually describing Noah's flood in the way the things are put together, and you're going, oh, no. <laughs> this is, this is uh, uh, Zechariah Sitchin's class of misrepresentation of the source material there. Uh, and then all of the people in the Mesoamerican thing, we allude to, you know, um, uh, when you get farther down into um, the rocks where there, you'll find out where we're talking about the Santa Inez Mountains and the Native Americans there and when this was occurring according to the flood. And have they really thought this through properly? It's related to Andrew Snelling. So uh, there's a little, there's something to look forward to of yet more stupid on, uh, on just how lickety split did the Native Americans who were kind of just waiting at the gate at um, the Bering Strait. And so the, the descendants of Noah were there in the period after the flood and they rush up to the Bering Strait and then they're waiting for the sea levels to drop precipitously in the instantaneous ice age so that then they can cross over to the Americas and they managed to populate the entire American continents, including the Santa Inez bunch down there in California. How quickly did they do this, Andrew? <laughs> RJ, stop thinking about it. You're not supposed to think about it. I know, if you don't think about that, you know, you know, we're not trying to explain the data. We want to have dogma. Isn't that just sweet? But anyway. If you don't uh, look about it, look, it all they're works They're Abrahamic, out, okay? they have like 50 children. Yeah, That's yeah. The, uh, most of them are, most of them died in child, uh, in childhood, but 
Oh, uh, Andy Lord brings up. Uh, Hi, Andy. I think you're new to the. I, I can't recall seeing you in the in the feeds in that before. Uh, if not, uh, if you've been there before, uh, my apologies for not the, the name ringing a bell. Anyways, his, his favorite part of that is AIG and their contradictory statements on population growth rates to get to the thirty thousand people they admit would be needed for a construction oh, project. Oh, he's talking about the potholer video. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, potholer fifty four is great. Uh, speaking of which, I am pleased to have seen uh, that he and Pologia both. He did. We're both uh, uh, mentioned in Rocks Chapter Two. Oh yeah, yeah. We've got some, and we uh, uh, PZ Myers is cited in it. He actually saw it. The book, the book is dedicated to Psy Strike. Oh yeah, that that is. And Volume Two is going to be dedicated to uh, Bill Ludlow. Yep. What happened? They died. They died. <laughs> Bill Ludlow died recently. Yeah, yeah. They he died, died just shortly like after Psy did. October, I think. He had a he, he had stomach cancer. He had yeah. a terrible, debilitating illness, and I, I absolutely give him props for how he just stuck it out because he had work to do, and he had started that project that Dapper Dino has been continuing uh, on interviewing uh, ex-creationists. And uh, this is a really important. Everybody that doesn't subscribe to Dapper Dino, please do so just for that. That yeah, uh, it, those interviews that he does Dapper are just absolutely great. delicious. Yeah. Um... The, his most recent uh, interview with Yonov Creationist was with a former AIG employee. Not like oh, uh, one of the scientists, juicy. but just Boy, one what of the a people bunch that works there. buckets they are in the yeah. employment department. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. I'll have to take a watch of that. Yeah. Would I be yeah, yeah, eligible he was talking for an about, interview with Depp or Dino or something? They were so unfeeling about uh, people who had illnesses and financial problems and that they basically under underpay everybody. Uh, they're just really, they're Trumpian. And big surprise, Ken Ham is not very nice. No, oh, no, no, I could see that a, from his. He's from an the arrogant. Interviews. Yeah, yeah, he's he's a very uh, arrogant and, and distant and not particularly nice uh, employer. And so that even beyond the discussion of the young Earth creationism aspect, um, uh, what I keep track of in my uh, issue is how many of them uh, were raised in a young earth creationist household and how deeply, what sources did they pay attention to, what apologetics uh, came along, because this is just wonderful primary source documentary, because here you have it kind of fresh in their mind, sometimes ridiculously fresh. Some of these people are you know, like just, just like almost last week have, have, have had doubts, and some of them maybe only a year or two since, and so they have a freshness of experience that is absolutely delicious to deal with, and it's really important to have that stuff documented. Uh, I come, as you may or may not have recognized, from a, a secular household. So I was not raised in a creationist. Though. I don't have any religion to give up. So I have a completely different perspective from it, from somebody that came from this. And I want to know what's going on inside their head in the same way that um, uh, oh, uh, the people who are ex-religionists, uh, who were very, very deeply religious, can tell you about what was going on in their head in a way that you wouldn't otherwise. I I uh, was never creationist, but I do have creationists in the family, so that's fun. Oh yeah, and, mo and most people do, well, uh, either either in their immediate family or people they've encountered in their social networks and all that. I mean, they're all over the place and uh, are now in government. Uh, Mark Meadows, although he apparently has tested positive for coronavirus, the news chief of staff, and so he's at, uh, at this point, into... at this point, what Republicans haven't. <laughs> that's true. You know, that's this may be a, a whole new. Well, they can they can just pray the coronavirus away. I'm sure Pence can manage that. It's worked so well in other cases. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, that reminds me of the one. What would you do scenario where they had someone trying to get another kid to to join them and quote pray the gay away. Mm. Oh, scientist Mel says Tom Hanks has the coronavirus. Well, that uh, that's disconcerting. Wait, but really? Yeah, yeah, just so there's... came out about an hour ago. He tested positive mm. with his wife in Australia, um, yeah. and so he's oh, in quarantine, shit. and he's in the yeah. um, the the age range where it could be fatal. We could yeah. lose Tom Hanks. Um, remember the the main point of um, washing hands and such is uh, in order to um, you know, keep yourself safe from uh, getting the virus, as uh, to perhaps keep the healthcare system from getting overwhelmed. Because oh, yeah, the more that, people and, and they get sick at once, the worse it will get. 
response team, uh, uh, Trump's gutting of the CDC, uh, which he did not discuss in his announcement. Oh, uh, uh, Andy Lohr says, thank um, um, uh, that uh, young earth creationism is incredibly rare in the United Kingdom. Uh, uh, that's quite true, although there are cadres of creationists there that have been there for like decades. So it, it, it's a homegrown movement uh, that percolates along uh, at the fringe level and they have a few websites and that I alluded to some of them in uh, Evolution Slam Dunk. Uh, but then there's also that newer generation of uh, AIG and ICR apologetics that likes to connect up with them. And of course, you've got the Discovery Institute in the gang, uh, uh, although they've done not a huge amount of apologetics in um, uh, the United Kingdom. One place where they've actually found uh, a bunch of support is in Brazil. Uh, and the uh, educational system there has been skewed in favor of intelligent design by the wackaloon president there. They have a little mini Trump uh, as their the fascists. Uh, yeah, that that's also possible to describe them that way. Yeah, uh, th this is a disconcert. Oh, by the way, I had an absolutely fabulous uh, lecture uh, that I attended at Whitworth University. Um, a y Ryan um, uh, Crocker, I think his name is, he's uh, um, a, a diplomat of long standing. It was for a while even a diplomat during the Trump administration. And his expertise is that whole Middle East area. He's been ambassador to quite a few of the countries around in that zone. And it was uh, kind of an impromptu one because he's doing a major speech uh, um, through the Foley Center down at WSU. but. Um, uh, since he's a Spokane native and there were people who knew him and the, uh, the groups at Whitworth said, can you talk to us just for a short period of time? And I found out about it from our secular network because one of the people there is a close friend of his. And so he was reminding us of it at our meeting. And so boop, I attended and it was absolutely delicious. It's um, uh, a, a further affirmation that there's a lot to be worried about in terms of the bad decisions that are being made currently uh, on foreign policy. What are his thoughts on the Iraq war? Oh, um, he didn't specifically go into to the the war itself directly, although hmm. the um, I, 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 it was not that he, I think his general position that came out of the of areas that he did discuss is that, uh, yes, Saddam Hussein was a nasty person, but it really stirred up a hornet's nest of complexity and that nobody involved that you know, this is one area where it did come up uh that they didn't really think through the consequences of intervention mm -hmm. so they didn't have a, a, a further end game and this was the same case with afghanistan and of course it's also uh, the case with a lot of the policies that we're dealing with now and oddly there is a certain there was a certain continuity between obama and uh, the trump administration in terms of wanting to disengage us from afghanistan as quickly as possible he just mm. says that the Trump administration has made this even more intense. And um, uh, that there was a wonderful map up on the thing that we have so many uncertain question marks floating around. It hasn't yet hit the fan yet. What's going on uh, to those little um, uh, old Soviet provinces that are right to the north of Afghanistan. Like Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. And yeah. they're, they're basically largely basket case economies but they're potentially future bits and then the other uh, uncertainty is china that really wants to get in that whole region everywhere that's got uh, natural resources that are strategic the chinese are trying to butt in and they of course actually have a border physically with a little teeny edge of afghanistan so there's an awful lot of excitement going on uh in there and um, it, it was just a, a riveting talk as he went into the background of why ISIS has not gone away, it's just gone underground, that, um, uh, and the, the roots of things. I, I kind of felt a little bit like the smart kid in the room because it was a whole bunch of college students. And he was asking some rhetorical questions of the audience about the, the roots of certain things, like what, what occurred in 1798 that was so relevant to this issue? And there was like crickets for a minute and I went, to, Napoleon invaded Egypt, <laughs> and <laughs> and so it was. Of it was course. kind of funky. <laughs> of course, RJ. and so I, I I was able to to deploy my historical information in a way that an awful lot of the younger people were not as aware of as they ought to have been. It, it was an absolutely wonderful address. History is nif neat. Um, well, you can't avoid be. it. Yeah, the... if you you can compare, say, um, the <clears throat> plan 
of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars to say the plans during the last three years of World War II by the Western Allies, um, which were, uh, I believe it was Operation Torch was the invasion of Italy? I can never remember the uh, name. Yeah, of it. yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. And uh, D-Day. Um, and the goal of Operation, both operations, the, the, pri the first primary goal was opening up on our front for the Soviet Union and uh, getting the Germans to commit to our fronts. Um, the goal of Torch was obviously deal with Italy, um, and with D-Day, it was primarily gain a beachhead, then uh, liberate France, then move on into Germany. Oh, and, and Germany. some of the, the, the historical side issues, uh, even today, um, the uh, uh, the longest day motion picture made in the 1960s is still a pretty darn good uh, coverage of it. You now also got Dunkirk and some of these other uh, films that have come along. Um, the the Italian campaign pops up rather prominently in the movie Patton, where you can see that, that there was an awful lot of really tough fighting going on, and to some extent, oh boy. diversion. I'm sure that's a fun movie. Up Sicily. Uh, Patton, Patton is a superb film to watch just for every possible respect in terms of the brilliant performances in it, the fabulous music by Jerry <laughs> Goldsmith that's only a half hour long out of this giant two hour plus movie, uh, but it's so tightly used that it's absolutely unforgettable. Uh, George C. Scott won an Oscar for playing Patton, but because he didn't believe in awards, he refused to accept it. <laughs> yeah, and, um, uh, A Bridge Too Far is another good one. It, uh, a, a, a bridge too far, a film too long, but it is a, a good film. It just it's oh, just very. a little long. I, I don't mind long films. It had, a, it had a good cast. It was a little. Oh, uh, uh, what's his name that directed it? Oh, Richard Attenborough. Uh, could be a little bit didactic at times. It, it's Hold on, it, it, you said Richard Attenborough, right? It was directed by John Hammond. <laughs> um, Still, Richard Attenborough. I have something to say. And here we see the natural sold, the soldier in his native habitat. Or, or David Attenborough. David Attenborough. Not Richard. Oh, we got him. okay. They're, they're the other one. Yeah, the other one. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, also directed uh, um, uh, Gandhi and all. But anyway, yeah, so it, it's, uh, there are a lot. Of, oh, and Tor Tor Tor. I'll throw in Tor 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 as still um, a somewhat controversial movie at the time. Directed that by was... the same guy that directed 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and Fantastic Voyage. That was uh, a Pacific place. Theater, wasn't it? It was about the, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And yeah. uh, because it was a co-production with the Japanese, there was some hysteria over it because all the Japanese sections were directed by, they almost had Akira Kurosawa until he had a meltdown during the production. <laughs> so they had to replace him with somebody else. He had, had a meltdown? Weird, weird blow up. But um, it's, it's a pretty darn historically accurate. It's not as, it was an expensive film to do and it, it, it went way over budget. I think it ended up like $40 million and, and got to be somewhat controversial because it, it didn't do ridiculously well at the box office for years, but it holds up extremely well. And another Jerry Goldsmith uh, background score uh, mm -hmm. that uh, they, they had so little money available for big name stars that they ended up trawling a mass of really competent TV actors who did some of their most magnificent performances in it. They were all people you'd be instantly familiar with from television, but they were not necessarily the, the A-name uh, um, uh, film actors. And I, But I, they became A-name film actors. Oh, yeah, was, yeah, Jason Robards, in fact, he, uh, and quite a few in there that had much bigger careers afterwards. But it, it it's, it's a film that I, I think is well worth watching. Although for the special effects, Pearl Harbor film is just gobsmackingly gorgeous to watch, just forget the stupid pot boiler plot that oh, they yeah, the, to it. The, uh, historical accuracy not so much the special effects great yeah uh, oh and sound mixing boy the things you know the bullets hitting the water and all of that is just just absolutely brilliant and so it is a very accurate depiction of the actual attack on on harbor and so just kind of skip the first hour and a half of the movie and then watch the, <laughs> the action adventure parts on it so so there that was a weird digression into into yeah. the historical element of things yeah and one of my favorite things about world war ii history if you adjust for the armor sloping on the sherman it's armor and front armor is just as thick as the tigers yeah oh andy it, andy lore said george c scott is amazing in patent there's a patent lot well there's quite a few patent lines in there that i enjoy quite a bit uh, for one thing it was a groundbreaking movie for profanity particularly that opening section which nowadays practically is g-rated but boy was it pushing the envelope in 1970. uh but th there's a thing where uh is highly relevant to creationism and how i approach it 
because at one point he's fighting this battle which he thinks is the, he's attacking the, the German army that's going to be coming up this big valley in uh, the North Africa. And Patton is there with his glasses and they're seeing the tanks come up and he says, oh, you goddamn son of a bitch, I read your book! <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, the, the fact of the matter that he knew how uh, Rommel fought because he had studied Rommel so thoroughly and knew his raw material. And it's exactly the same thing we're doing with the creationists. We read their books. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Jesus. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, it is an absolutely magnificent. Uh, 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 Malden. Uh, is wonderful in it, and uh, you'll, it, it, the, the score, you will never be able to forget the Jerry Goldsmith music from Patton once you see the damn thing. And preferably, if you have a Blu-ray player, get the Blu-ray edition to see, because that will just knock your socks off does it, how gorgeous the filming is. Does anyone have Blu-ray anymore, RJ? Uh, I hope I, so. We, we have a very um, bulky Blu-ray I haven't player. watched a film on actual hardware in years. What, do years? you just stream? Yeah. I, uh, yes. <laughs> well, I yeah, like I like I streaming. like the, um, the the home video yes. aspect of it because t typically there will be documentaries and audio commentaries and all that kind of stuff. That's that's although they're starting to do that, I guess, on some streaming. Uh, it's it, uh, but um, if you have a high resolution, whatever format you deal with, so long as it's a higher resolution one, because. Patton was filmed in Camera 55. I think there was only two movies, both of which oddly had George C. Scott in them. Um, the, the Bible <laughs> that, that uh, John Huston made uh, was filmed in Camera 55. Uh, it's a 70 millimeter film process. Uh, and then um, uh, Patton, and that's the only ones. This was at the very tail end of they stopped doing these hyper large screen uh, 70 millimeter film processes. And up until very recently, now they've started to do that a bit as they've started to do 70 millimeter IMAX and uh, higher frame rate stuff and all of that where they're now playing around because they, they have all digital film projection systems now. We're geeking out uh, their um, uh, uh, digital film projection system so they don't use film canisters anymore at almost every movie theater. They just bring in a little cartridge that has the, the, the information that the film is on it and plug it in and there it is. So now, you can of course do I have to say the information content provided by this little digression is greater than the information content from any creationist in the history. All it taken all it's together true. and and literally Aleph null infinite more information than in the James Cole tweet. <laughs> That's true. It, I it, stand it's... firm on that. Uh, I did practically it makes... here today. Darny fudge, you know. I hope it, you come it's down with practically Jupiter compared to um, the grain of sand that is the entirety of oh. every last um, Speaking of weird internet. planets, did you hear just the latest announcement about that super hot planet that apparently rains iron? I nice. told my friend about how about that about how they couldn't get me to land on that planet if I was promised an infinite amount of fun time with mm -hmm. all the cat girls and fox girls. Well, and you don't want to you don't want to have a job <laughs> on Jupiter's moon of Io uh, or uh, that because it's inside of its radiation belts and it'll fry your damn balls off. Don't accept any job offers for Io kids. I think Ganymede is the only or no or Callisto. Callisto, I think, is the only one of the Galilean moons of Jupiter that's outside of its 10,000 rad fry your balls off radiation field. So is that why we'll never find life on Europa? Uh, no, there might be life on Europa. Uh, uh, it, 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 uh, it could be shielded um, underneath. I'd still want to send probes there to see what's going on in their little oceans. Despite um, the fact that get, the radiation will fry the probes balls off? Well, but there's no indication that other organisms might not be able to deal with that. It's just life as we're familiar with it is Well, hold matter. on. It, no, no, no. There is life that we're familiar with that can deal with such punishment. Tardigrade. Oh, well, no, actually. Dinococcus radiodurans. Oh, some of those that have, that have, that have kind of uh, uh, lapping up Chernobyl. Well, well it's just a can... it's just a bacterium with an endospore, so it can, with a very, very tough endospore so it can survive in a lot of places oh uh also latest pnas i was just plowing through a little bit earlier uh some new papers a pair of papers on uh, endosymbiosis issues 
Uh, Ford Doolittle was the uh, a guy who was uh, um, putting them in there, although he's not one of the authors, but he was the one who advised on it. Oh, from the uh, Wikipedia. One on the organism, the little parasite that has no mitochondria at all, and then that, which is really unusual. And then another one where they're talking about uh, the examples of it in relation to uh, indications of what the early process of endosymbiosis is. So that's, that's some neat new stuff. Oh, and, and a news bulletin, and this one, I, I think it's available open access, so anybody can, can read it. Uh, oh. This will be a shock to you, but that oil companies and fossil fuel interests have been have a tendency to contribute to politicians who vote against the environment. Duh. Wow. Who would have known? I know. That's, I, I just, you could have blown me over with an anvil on that one. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. It gets better. Dinococcus radio durans can survive cold dehydration, vacuum, acid, and a big ton of radiation, and has been nicknamed Conan the Bacterium. <laughs> yeah, every time uh, we think about what the limits of organisms are, um, um, I think probably some of that bacteria. stuff pops up because of potential uh, oh, uh, pan, uh, genesis thing of, of organisms from outer space uh, kind of thing. Uh, oh, Lisa asks, uh, is mitochondria an ERV? Uh, no, uh, it's it's an actual remnant bacterium, uh, but it's, it tends to, there's a weird dance that goes on between the mitochondria and the cells they are component of to where uh, they trade off and, and get rid of some of their genome to lighten up, but they retain their own DNA. Uh, and then on the other hand, they kind of keep their little mitts on vital processes so that the host organism can't possibly ever get rid of them. Uh, although that apparent one organism apparently has managed to pull off the trick, but it, they're, they're a bunch of them. Yeah. Then you have layers of endosymbiosis as endosymbiotic components get incorporated into new endosymbiotic subclusters and topoid. you start going into those damn algae and that's there. They're just rampant orgies of endosymbiotic yeah, multiplicity. And, and creationists will ignore, completely ignore that um mitochondria have their own DNA and just say, no, this is design. And it plays a role there. It comes up in Appendix 3 in the new book uh, because uh, so many of the uh, codon reassignments relate to mitochondria. And that, so that's kind of a little side issue on, on that. So anyway, more reasons for everybody to have uh, the rocks were there because he's just chock a block with wonderful science information plus Almost on every single page, you get to read about creationists suffering from cranial blockage of the rectum. Yeah, and I can confirm, chapter two has a mammoth amount of information. Oh on yeah, now you're into the radioactive deal. dating chapter. Yeah. <laughs> so I think uh, we should. We're way past. We're an hour and a half into the show, so I think we should probably call it a night for the time. And, probably. And we'll see you all next week, gang. Uh, let us know when we're off the air, Mel. And thank you again for hosting. Thanks, Mel. Happy to thank do you, it. Mel. Signing off, guys. Oh, yeah, we went kind of all over the place. Oh, yeah, we're riff off of the latest incoming science information uh, that 